Good morning, everyone. My name is Molly Mack, and it is my pleasure to introduce our Grand Round speaker this morning, Dr. Dermody, the chair of the Department of Pediatrics, who will be presenting to us today the state of the Department of Pediatrics. Thank you, Molly, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the State of the Department of Pediatrics uh, 2021. Uh, uh, thanks all for coming. Uh, a special thanks to Mark Sepko, uh, Diane Hupp, Brian Martin, the CHP leadership team, and Rachel Petroselli and her leadership team from the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh Foundation. Um, and I am pleased to report fellow Childrenians uh, that the state of our department is sound. I would expect some thunderous uh, applause um, uh, after that, um, uh, but I'll uh, just acknowledge that uh, you were applauding. We've had uh, a wonderful year, a remarkable year, uh, despite what could be uh, charitably called uh, some fairly challenging uh, circumstances. Uh, I wish I could share uh, all of our accomplishments, but I will do my best uh, to share some of uh, the many accomplishments we have made uh, in the next hour. Uh, for those who have uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, reflections, uh, please join me in the meet and greet uh, uh, immediately following uh, this Grand Rounds uh, presentation. It's Grand Rounds, so I have some financial disclosures to make. Let me do that here. So uh, first, uh, masks and vaccine save lives and money. Uh, that's my uh, financial uh, disclosure uh, for today. Now, our game plan is uh, I'll give you a slight um, uh, brief uh, overview uh, of our department. Um, I'll share some important education, training and career uh, development updates. Uh, I'll review a couple of our major discoveries. We've made many and I'll review a couple of those. Um, I'll then describe some of our clinical service accomplishments, um, uh, talk a bit about COVID-19 and pediatrics, um, uh, what it means for us right now and then uh, uh, give some thanks uh, to our division and uh, divisional and executive uh, leadership. Well, let me start uh, at the beginning with our vision. Uh, it is our vision to be the worldwide leader in pediatric healthcare uh, education and discovery. Uh, our desire to lead is because the problems uh, that we seek to solve are hard. Uh, they're unlikely to be solved uh, through the efforts of single individuals we need teams to solve these problems and to form teams uh, we need to lead. And we think we can lead best as humble servants, uh, doing our very best to support members of our teams. And this we think is the strategy to help us uh, have the greatest impact in improving uh, the lives of children uh, today. We're a big group. We have 25 divisions, uh, centers and institutes um, and, and a large group of um, members of our department uh, who all together uh, constitute uh, the Department of Pediatrics and allow us uh, to achieve uh, this vision. We now have 342 faculty, 103 clinical fellows, 131 residents, 47 research fellows, 22 graduate students, 240 research staff, 410 clinical staff, and this entire group is supported by 33 administrative staff uh, persons. We are a total of 328 strong. Uh, we're an amazing group. When we look at the uh, distribution of ethnicity in our faculty, we find that uh, the majority of our faculty, 71% uh, uh, identify as white, 20% uh, identify as Asian. Uh, one member of our faculty is a, a Native American. Uh, we have four who identify as black, uh, 22 who identify as Latinx, and four who identify as uh, a mixed race. Um, uh, when you look at the gender distribution, uh, we're a department um, uh, of 63% women and 37% uh, percent men. In terms of the um, uh, ranks uh, of our faculty by gender, uh, you can appreciate that um, our assistant professors, the majority of our assistant professors um, uh, are women. Um, uh, a slight majority of our associate professors are women and we have um, uh, not quite two to one, but more men full professors than we do uh, women. And I will tell you that this ratio is gradually um, approaching unity uh, uh, over the several years um, uh, that we've been tracking uh, these data. And I um, anticipate that will continue uh, to be the case as our women assistant professors earn promotion to associate and our women associate professors earn a promotion to full professor. We had 18 uh, promotions in the Department of Pediatrics this year, 18 um, uh, amazing. 
I want to offer congratulations to John and Amy and Craig and Way, Brian, Eric, Nursen, uh, Jenny, and uh, Bernard, all promoted uh, uh, before um, uh, August 1, uh, 2021, this last academic year. And then similarly, uh, congratulations to Mushmi and Gisela and Ray and Kristen, uh, Tom and Sonny, uh, uh, Jim, Melissa, and Calvani. Um, uh, congratulations to you. And a very special congratulations to Alejandra Hoberman, who was appointed this year as a Distinguished Service Professor of Pediatrics, uh, one of the very highest honors uh, our university uh, bestows. Uh, congratulations, Alejandro. And I should add, any time that you want to applaud, please feel free to do so. Uh, I uh, really enjoy uh, the thunderous applause. We've had many awards this year. I asked the division directors to send me um, uh, especially meritorious awards. I have far too many to share, but here's just a snapshot. Congrats to Silva Arcelanian, who was appointed to the Oversight Advisory Committee of the AHA Cardiometabolic and Type 2 Diabetes Research Network. Rachel Berger received the Ray E. Helfer Society Award for Distinguished Contributions in Child Abuse and Neglect, uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award. Sylvia Choi received the William I. Cohen Teacher of the Year Award from our residents. Marie Escalar received an Innovation Institute Startup of the Year Award for her work with Forge Biologics. Yukiko Gio from Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine received the uh, Nurse Practitioner Preceptor of the Year Award. Tim Hand uh, from Infectious Disease received a Burroughs Welcome Fund Investigators in the Pathogenesis of Infectious Disease Award. Jackie Kreutzer, a founding member and appointed secretary of the Pediatric Interventional Cardiovascular Society. Uh, Annie McCormick received a Pitt School of Medicine Social Justice Educator Award. Deb Moss was appointed to the board of the Pennsylvania Partnerships for Children. John Smuziak uh, received a Pitt School of Medicine Early Career Educator Award. Jane Taylor from Pulmonology received the American Thoracic Society Pediatrics Assembly Clinician Educator Award. And finally in this group, Holly Thomas received the Physician Assistant Preceptor of the Year Award. It's the first time we've been able to acknowledge two of our advanced practice providers for this kind of um, uh, recognition. Uh, congratulations to all these award recipients and so many more that I couldn't uh, share with you because of time. But wait, there are more awards uh, that I wanna share. Um, we received an amazing nine UPMC Excellence in Patient Experience Awards this year. Um, of 7,600 UPMC physicians and advanced practice providers, only 48 were selected for this recognition. This is based on patient experience uh, reflections uh, on our providers. 19, nine out of 48 is 19%. Uh, again, pediatrics uh, uh, um, uh, doing a tremendous job relative to our uh, peers. I wanna offer congratulations to Deb and Gaurav, Mark and Paul, Jim, Amy, Bob, uh, Whitney and Cassie, uh, what wonderful work you're doing. We also um, uh, received three ACEs awards this year. Uh, this is award for uh, commitment uh, and excellence in service. And so congratulations, Jess Garrison, Elizabeth Hewitt, and Sylvia Owusu Ansa for receiving uh, these ACEs awards. We feel fortunate when one of our faculty has received an ACEs award and for three to receive an ACEs award is just short of amazing. Jackie Ho and Ling Lin uh, this year were elected into the American Society of Clinical Investigation. This is a, um, a major uh, important um, uh, recognition, an honorific society uh, that serves uh, to recognize uh, scholarly contributions of mid-level faculty. Uh, all uh, disciplines are included in the ASCI, um, including pediatricians, and two of our very finest uh, pediatric physician scientists were inducted into the ASCI this year. Congratulations, Jackie and Ling, how well-deserved. Eric Forno uh, from the Division of Pediatric Pulmonology received this year the Gail and Ira Drupier Prize in Children's Health Research. This is an amazing big deal. Um, uh, junior to mid-level faculty are nominated from throughout the country and a single uh, recipient is chosen. And this year it was Eric Forno for his amazing contributions in the area of molecular epidemiology and treatment of asthma. Well done, uh, Eric. 
Wait, there's even more. Our very own Dorothy Becker received the Pediatric Endocrine Society Van Wick Prize. Uh, this is a lifetime achievement award for accomplishments in leadership, science, and dedication to the health of children. Here she is with Ingrid Libman and Radhika Muzumdar, who organized a symposium for uh, Dorothy last week that was uh, nothing short of amazing. Congratulations, Dorothy, and congratulations on your appointment as Professor of Pediatrics Emeritus. We had a couple of other notable retirements uh, last year that I wanted to share. Uh, both Janet and Rob Squires uh, were appointed Professor of Pediatrics Emeritus and have started an entire new career uh, where their uh, motto is to provide childcare for all. And Janet Rob, uh, from the bottom of all of our hearts, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for all of your work uh, at Children's um, uh, to improve uh, the lives of kids here and uh, truly throughout the world. And we wish you all the success in your new career. I wanna now say a couple of words about our Office of Faculty Development. This office is um, uh, 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 led by our Vice Chair of Faculty Affairs, Sylvia Choi, and the Director of the office is Erica Freeling. Uh, Sylvia and Eric are joined by uh, Rick Saladino, Mel Tavares, and our newest member, Marin uh, Luno, who's focused on physician well being, uh, to promote uh, our faculty to help them with uh, leadership, scholarship, education, advancement, mentorship, and of course, uh, wellness. And I want to acknowledge the many, many contributions of Dina Hopkosh, uh, the founding director of the Office of Faculty Development, uh, newly appointed professor of pediatrics emeritus uh, for recruiting this team and helping uh, to chart the initial course. There are many, many activities of the OFD uh, that I could describe for you this morning. I just want to highlight uh, a couple and then uh, let you know that uh, Sylvia and Erica and the OFD team uh, will be making uh, regular appearances at our faculty meetings as they have done in the past to share with you new developments in this uh, vital area for our entire department. A key goal um, uh, of the Office of Faculty Development is uh, to promote uh, leadership excellence uh, through training and leadership. Um, uh, this uh, opportunity became evident in our very first physician well-being uh, survey that was done in 2018. Uh, emphasized again uh, in 2020, and then in the My Voice survey results. Uh, our faculty uh, benefit from training in leadership and appreciate leadership, and we would like to support these activities in any way we can. In so doing, uh, we've developed um, uh, leadership programming for senior department leaders. We've been doing this for about uh, two years now. Uh, last year, we started training uh, for clinical service directors and this year, we're going to begin a training for mid-career and rising uh, leaders. Perhaps the most important uh, aspect of this training is a new mentorship academy, a mentoring academy that you'll hear more about in the future. Uh, we're grateful for the partnership of the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC and various leadership programming. Uh, many of you have participated uh, in these programs, and I guarantee you many more of you will participate in the future. They're terrific. Uh, provide lots of useful information. Our faculty have really enjoyed them. The Office of Faculty Development uh, also um, uh, provides uh, several grants to promote um, uh, scholarship uh, with our faculty. Uh, this year, Addie Eichmann, uh, Jess Garrison, and John Smuziak received education innovation grants. Um, Tanya Syed uh, from Adolescent Young Adult Medicine received a leadership development grant uh, to learn uh, about uh, uh, plant-based nutrition how to teach about it. And Jackie Saladino from GAP uh, received a Pediatrics Medical Education Scholar Grant uh, to focus on a new curriculum to integrate primary care uh, into resident didactic uh, learning. Uh, congratulations to these grant recipients. And I encourage those who haven't been supported by these mechanisms, who have ideas uh, about scholarship in this area, please reach out to Sylvia and Erica to ask them more about the programs and please apply. Uh, everyone uh, in the department is eligible. We've made um, uh, lots of uh, initiatives uh, this year uh, in the uh, area of diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. Uh, it's just been one year since we appointed uh, Loretta Mateo as our vice chair and Sylvia Wosu uh, as our associate vice chair of DEI. 
and they have um, uh, done so much uh, good work in the area of recruitment, retention, education, and advocacy to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I want to provide just a couple of highlights of, uh, of their many, many accomplishments. Um, the first to, to um, uh, describe is the CHAMP program, Career Advancement and Achievement Mentorship Program. CHAMP is based at the Arsenal Middle School, uh, which is, of course, on 40th, uh, uh, just south of Butler, um, uh, with the direction of uh, Sylvia, along with Kiki Torres and Noel Zuckerbron. Uh, they develop a mentorship program where our medical students uh, mentor uh, these middle school students, and the medical students are in turn mentored uh, by members of our faculty. Uh, we also do a lot of health and science education with this in, within this program, and I'm very excited uh, that we're back to face-to-face -face instruction, which will make our work um, uh, uh, move so much more seamlessly with CHAMP. We've um, incorporated a number of new educational initiatives uh, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, area. Just two, uh, Loretta Mateo has developed a new elective, the Children's Hospital Virtual uh, underrepresented in medicine elective or CHIP view uh, that starts on Monday. Uh, this is an elective for uh, those underrepresented medicine and medical school to learn more about uh, pediatrics, to help us recruit um, more of those from uh, underrepresented communities uh, in uh, uh, to our um, discipline. We've also developed an anti-racism curriculum and I wanna thank um, uh, Praveen uh, um, uh, Raghunanthan and Nick Zoko for development of this curriculum uh, that uh, was initially um, uh, developed for the residents and now is moving to the fellows uh, and will soon be uh, in uh, several of our divisions. And so um, uh, Bravine and Nick, if you're listening in, uh, uh, thank you for your hard work and others who have uh, played a hand in developing this important curriculum. And we've done a lot of work in the recruiting domain, uh, work to recruit residents, uh, fellows and faculty, so many people uh, have pitched in uh, to help with this. And I just wanna tell you about one program that uh, makes me especially proud. And that's the Dean's Cluster Hire Program. This is a program that was uh, established by uh, Dean Ananta Shaker uh, 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 late last year uh, to promote uh, the recruitment of uh, faculty members from uh, uh, groups uh, traditionally underrepresented in medicine. Uh, the Dean provides uh, salary support, uh, and also a loan repayment feature uh, for these recruits uh, for a three to four year interval and, uh, and encourages uh, applications from all departments. So you can appreciate here on the left-hand side of this bar chart that in pediatrics, we had six applications, uh, five were able to accept those applications, one really needed to uh, move to another city to be uh, with her partner. So we feel this is very, very good return and uh, I included on the slide some other uh, departments and disciplines just to give you a sense of how well the Department of Pediatrics is doing in this domain. And I can't thank Loretta Mateo enough uh, for these efforts. Uh, Loretta reviewed every one of these applications, helped the division directors craft them, and certainly contributed to our success in our um, uh, applicants being uh, funded by this uh, important program. Of the five new faculty, just to mention, uh, three are Black, one's Latinx, and one is a Native American. This is just fantastic work um, by Loretta and her colleagues uh, and others who have helped uh, in this endeavor. <clears throat> I want to move on and talk about um, some important developments in education, education training, and, and uh, career development, um, and uh, acknowledge many, many uh, fine educators uh, that have contributed uh, uh, to these efforts. We have a, a terrific team uh, focused on undergraduate medical education. Um, we educate uh, between 140 and 160 uh, third year medical students uh, each year. Um, uh, this year, we uh, uh, contributed to the education of 113 uh, senior medical students. Uh, it's, it's quite an accomplishment. I wanna thank our clerkship directors, uh, uh, John and Amy, as well as the uh, co-directors, uh, Emily and Katie, uh, for their efforts uh, directing the third year clerkship. Our acting internship uh, directed by um, uh, Laura and Betsy, thank you. Um, uh, Brett McKinnich uh, directs the pediatric EM uh, po portion uh, of our clerkship. And then uh, uh, thanks to Annie McCormick, Nima Shah for uh, directing the pediatric advanced physical exam course. And let me take this opportunity to thank uh, so many of you uh, on the faculty who are participating in that uh, physical exam course. 
boy, that's a work that takes a whole village. And I'm very, very grateful uh, to you for uh, leaning in and doing that work. And Marlin High supports all of this effort, uh, an administrative uh, a tour de force, Marlin. And uh, thank you for all your efforts uh, to help us uh, educate uh, our outstanding Pitt medical students. We have a fabulous pediatric residency program. It's the best pediatric residency program on the planet, uh, ably led by our co-directors, uh, Annie Nowak and Kate Watson. And of course, they're uh, assisted by our associate program directors, Rhett Lieberman, Katie Pollack, Ben Miller, and Jim Wolford. And, and I, I compliment them so on their effective leadership, commitment to our residents, and the fact that they were able to fashion these um, extremely lifelike face masks um, that really make it look like they're not wearing masks at all, but, but in fact they are. Um, uh, uh, Kate and Andy, please share those secrets uh, with the rest of us. Um, we recruited 41 outstanding first year residents uh, this year, 41 um, uh, uh, residents recruited to our team. We need every single one of them. They're working very hard right now, uh, along with the second and third year residents. Of course, all our fellows too, more about that in a moment, but an incredible group. They truly come uh, from uh, throughout the world, although most uh, are from the Eastern US. We have a resident from Ireland, another from Colombia. We have a resident from Texas. It's truly an international uh, group uh, that form our incoming residents. The residents uh, are led by our chief residents, Jimmy Bowen, Molly Mack, Molly Marshall, and Jake White. Um, uh, thank you so much for your hard work uh, leading this uh, superb uh, resident team. They also have the lifelike face masks that uh, uh, the program directors do as well. And again, share those with the rest of us because we'd, we'd like to use them. Now, each year I ask uh, 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 the residency uh, directors to send along the top 10 uh, teachers as judged by our residents. Uh, yes, we evaluate uh, the residents and of course the residents evaluate us with regard to our teaching effectiveness. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the top 10 teachers in the Department of Pediatrics as judged by our residents, perhaps the most discerning group of learners we have on our campus. So here they are, uh, Sylvia Choi, Oscar Escobar, Erica Freeling, Jenna Gesser, Laura Jackson, Sarah McIntyre, Andy Nowak, Arvin Srinath, Kayani Vats, and Kate Watson. I would like all of us to stand and applaud these fantastic teachers. Um, uh, join me in acknowledging their contributions. It's just amazing. Okay, all can be seated now. And I just wanna point out that uh, there are a couple who uh, grace the top 10 list uh, 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 every year, every other year or so. But every year, the majority of the top 10 performers are new to the list. Some who have never appeared uh, on this list since we've started compiling it uh, now six years ago. And this uh, is a testament to the quality of education at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh uh, when it comes to educating uh, our residents and by extension, our students and fellows and our faculty colleagues. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you uh, educators. We have an amazing uh, 20 uh, pediatric uh, subspecialty residency programs or fellowships. Um, every discipline uh, is represented uh, by leaders uh, in the fields uh, who coordinate and direct these fellowship programs and our fellows are absolutely spectacular. I won't read all of these, uh, but know um, uh, that they all are vital uh, to our mission at Children's. And I thank uh, the division directors and the fellowship directors for the hard work they do in coordinating uh, these fellowship programs. Um, uh, all of this uh, uh, fellowship um, uh, work uh, is led by Noel Zuckerbron, our vice chair of education, and Arvind Srinath, who's an associate vice chair of education looking after the fellowship, and Pat Bustich, uh, our uh, fellowship coordinator, who keeps track of all uh, of our fellows and the training grants that support them and the numerous other um, uh, uh, administrative functions that must be uh, carried out to support our fellowship program. Now I wanna turn next uh, uh, to our uh, research um, uh, mission in the Department of Pediatrics, uh, highlight a couple of major discoveries, but first I, I wanna acknowledge uh, John G. Rango Sr. Uh, Mr. Rango uh, sadly passed away um, uh, earlier this year just a few days uh, short of uh, what would have been his 92nd birthday. Uh, in addition uh, uh, to uh, supporting 
uh, in helping to fund uh, the building uh, that bears his name, Mr. Rangos, uh, through his uh, philanthropy, uh, supported many, many research endeavors uh, at Children's Hospital, including work uh, on cancer research and cardiology, uh, diabetes, and most recently uh, to establish uh, the Pittsburgh Vaccine Trials Unit. Um, so much of what we do has been made possible um, by uh, Mr. John G. Rangos. Uh, and with heartfelt thanks uh, to, the, to Mr. Rangos and his family uh, for their gracious support uh, of our research mission and truly everything we do at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Now, last year, uh, we published 571 peer-reviewed uh, manuscripts, 571. Miranda Feldman counted every single one and Brendan Linton tweeted every single one. And so I know these numbers uh, to be true. I asked the division directors to look over the uh, papers published by members of their division and send me uh, the top three uh, that they thought uh, were worthy of highlight uh, at State of the Department. And I really wish I could uh, share with you all approximately 60 of these uh, publications, but I only have time uh, to share four. And so uh, I picked these four because they represent uh, the breadth of research uh, that we do at Children's, uh, some uh, of these uh, studies by established investigators, uh, others uh, by those who are uh, becoming established, um, but all amazing in their own right, uh, contributing uh, to improving the lives of children uh, today uh, and in the future. The first paper I wanna highlight is a study that was led by uh, Carl Bates, our Vice Chair of Basic Research and Director of the Division of Pediatric Nephrology. Um, this study published in the American uh, Journal of Pathology focuses on um, uh, mechanisms by which uh, the bladder, uh, which of course receives the fluid produced by uh, uh, the organs that uh, uh, Carl tells me uh, serve as the seat of the soul uh, and how uh, the bladder responds to injury and heals. His focus recently has been on this uh, 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 growth factor receptor, fibroblast, fibroblast growth factor receptor two or FGFR2, and the signaling network that it uh, uh, connects uh, and the role played in uh, bladder regeneration uh, after uh, various forms of injury. The focus of this paper is cyclophosphamide, um, a commonly employed chemotherapeutic uh, that uh, can injure the uh, uh, bladder in children and adults. Carl engineered mice uh, that lack the FGFR2 uh, receptor um, uh, just uh, in the uh, bladder epithelium. Uh, these are these FGF uh, receptor 2 knockout mice and compared these animals to wild type animals after uh, cyclophosphamide uh, injury. And what Carl found is that when uh, compared to wild type animals, the uroepithelium, the lining of the bladder, has more hemorrhage, and you can see that here. Um, this is uh, red blood cells, uh, uh, indicative of hemorrhage. And the nuclei in the uroepithelium are enlarged and abnormal. He also stained uh, sections from wild type and uh, the knockout animals with keratin-20. Uh, this is a marker of regeneration. You can see a lot more of it in the wild type than in the knockouts. And uroplakin 3A, and this is another marker of uh, uroepithelial regeneration there's a lot more of it you can see at the periphery here uh, in this uh, regenerating bladder. So the key point is that mice that lack FGF receptor two uh, following cyclophosphamide injury have increased hemorrhage and cell loss and decreased regenerating uh, immature superficial cells. This important discovery is the first step to understanding the mechanism by which the bladder is damaged as a consequence of cyclophosphamide and provides a way forward in thinking about uh, ameliorating um, uh, uh, therapeutics so we can protect the bladder uh, from injuries uh, like this, uh, a beautiful study of Carl's. Next, I wanna highlight work of Maria Escalar and Paul Schiboltz. And this is work focused on uh, the treatment of uh, Crabbe disease. Crabbe is caused by a deficiency of an enzyme called galacto cerebrosidase, many syllables in galactocerebrosidase. Uh, it breaks down um, uh, complex um, uh, uh, sugars and uh, contributes to a lysosomal storage disease that ultimately injures neurons 
and it's just not survivable in the vast majority of cases. Uh, what uh, Paul and uh, uh, Maria have been doing over the years is uh, trying to understand the natural history of this disease and develop uh, new uh, therapies. This landmark study uh, published uh, this year in the journal Blood um, uh, describes the results of treatment of children with Crab A uh, with hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And I just want to review a summary of uh, their data. They reviewed four patient groups. Uh, three were transplanted and one was not. Uh, they transplanted asymptomatic uh, uh, children, uh, those who developed symptoms uh, at an age less than 12 months, those who developed symptoms at an age greater than 12 months, and compared them to an untreated control group um, uh, who were not transplanted. What they found is that uh, the outcomes were especially good. This is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. This is just simply survival uh, in the asymptomatics and those who had symptom onset greater than 12 months. Uh, their survival was much longer uh, than those uh, children who were transplanted uh, less than 12 months of age or the untreated uh, uh, historical control group. Uh, moreover, uh, neural developmental outcomes, uh, not surprisingly, uh, were much better in the uh, children transplanted uh, when they were asymptomatic uh, or when they uh, developed symptom onset uh, greater than uh, 12 months. Um, uh, this is an amazing um, uh, observation, uh, uh, truly the first advance in the treatment for this incurable genetic disease and sets the stage for a new work to combine uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant with gene therapy uh, uh, to uh, attempt uh, to obtain even better outcomes. And those trials are gonna begin uh, shortly. I wanna highlight a study uh, by Allison Silva. And uh, Allison is um, uh, uh, an assistant professor with us in the division of adolescent and young adult medicine. This isn't Allison's uh, first uh, last author paper, but I picked it uh, in part because I'm very interested in the topic and the first author is uh, Nick Soko, uh, a former chief resident and now a first year fellow in adolescent and young adult medicine. What Allison and her team uh, did was to um, uh, survey uh, middle school and high school students in the Pittsburgh area to try and understand uh, what might be associated with protection against vaping and other uh, tobacco use. It's a fascinating study, it's huge. Um, uh, they had almost 2,500 uh, study participants uh, with a mean age just short of 16 years. Um, uh, 1,126 reported a history of vaping at some point uh, in their lifetimes. 671, 27% uh, reported recent vaping, vaping within uh, 30 days. And what they found is the two um, uh, factors that correlated uh, with um, uh, uh, not vaping uh, were future orientation, the way these adolescents thought about um, uh, their future and parental monitoring. So what's shown here are the prevalence ratio, uh, the overall and the adjusted prevalence ratio on a number of demographic uh, data uh, showing statistically significant associations with future orientation and less vaping and parental monitoring. Uh, substantial reductions uh, in, in vaping with these two. Uh, they also looked at uh, social support and school uh, connectedness and, and didn't see an association uh, between those uh, parameters and vaping. But in fact, uh, all of those parameters, future orientation, parental monitoring, uh, school support, uh, and social connectedness, uh, all uh, were associated with decreased uh, uh, tobacco use. The reason why this study is so important is because uh, with this information, we now know uh, the correlative features that um, uh, uh, diminish the use of uh, tobacco in adolescents. And it really helps us now um, uh, develop intervention trials uh, so that uh, we can help kids not start or help kids stop. And this is ongoing work of Allison and her colleagues right now, uh, an absolutely lovely study. The last study to highlight uh, is a study of uh, Alejandro Hoberman and uh, Nader Sheikh, longtime collaborators with, with many of their colleagues in general academic pediatrics, uh, uh, Sonica uh, Botnagar, uh, uh, Gisela Munoz, uh, Tim Shope, uh, Judy Martin, and others uh, contributed to this uh, uh, wonderful work um, uh, testing uh, tiponostomy tubes versus medical management in children who have recurrent uh, cutotitis media. 
this study was so important. Um, uh, I first uh, learned of it when um, uh, that it was published uh, when I read about it in New York Times. Uh, Alejandro and Nader had briefed me on the work, so I knew it was coming. Uh, but the New York Times was my uh, first um, uh, knowledge that the study was, was in print. Let me just show you a couple of highlights of this important work. Um, this uh, is sort of a reverse Kaplan-Meier uh, analysis uh, uh, shows the time to first episode of acute uh, otitis media after children are randomized to either medical management, uh, shown here in the blue, or to tympanostomy tube uh, placement, shown in the red. And in fact, uh, kids who are treated medically, uh, their time to the very first episode uh, of otitis after randomization is a little bit faster. Um, uh, that's for sure true. But when you look at the uh, overall two-year uh, uh, primary and secondary outcomes, I'll just draw your attention to uh, the year one and year two combined rate per child. And what they found is in these kids who had recurrent otitis uh, and randomized to tympanostomy tubes, uh, they had about one and a half episodes of acute otitis media within a two-year observation interval. And that's about the same uh, as the kids who are randomized to medical management uh, for a p-value of 0 0.66, so a flip of the coin. So this important study uh, shows us that um, uh, whether children receive tympanostomy tubes are treated with uh, antibiotics for their recurrent episodes uh, of otitis, uh, it doesn't make a difference with regard to the frequency of episodes. This is a very important study that will change current practice. Um, uh, congratulations, Alejandro, uh, Nader, and your team. We've enjoyed some spectacular support uh, in the Department of Pediatrics this year. Uh, our research revenues uh, increased almost $13 million to a total of $65.4 million. A lot of this increase has been um, to support our COVID research activities, uh, specifically the Pittsburgh Vaccine Trials Unit. But as you'll see in a moment, we've had a lot of success uh, in uh, earning grants from the NIH and other funders. The majority of our funding does come from the NIH, uh, 36%. Uh, these subcontracts, however, also uh, include a lot of NIH uh, support. So well over half of all of our research funding uh, comes uh, from these uh, um, uh, federal funders. We had uh, four new K awards this year. Uh, congrats to uh, um, uh, Kelly Bailey, Soyoung Kim, uh, Emery Rick, and Glenn Repsinski, who all received K awards, well done. We had a total of 20 major new grants. Um, uh, these are grants uh, 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 to separate them from contracts. We had many huge contracts, but just to highlight the grants, uh, and I define major as greater than $250,000 per year. Um, I won't read all of them to you, but I do want to highlight uh, grants of Radha Gopal and Melissa Kane, as well as Amanda Pahalik. These are first R01 grants uh, for um, uh, these uh, remarkable uh, faculty members. Uh, congratulations. And likewise, uh, I want to highlight uh, the first R01 grant of Kristen Ray, uh, another um, uh, remarkable faculty member. Uh, congratulations to all our grant recipients, especially those uh, with new grants. I want to thank very much our foundation and our foundation leadership team. They work so hard to support every aspect of our mission, our clinical care, our education, and of course, our discovery efforts. So thank you, Rachel, uh, and your wonderful team, uh, Karen Depperman, Robin Weber, Larissa Graddick, and Greg Keegan. Not picture on this slide is Mark Snyder. Mark chairs uh, the Children's Hospital Foundation Board. Uh, I can't think of a harder working group of people uh, that raise the funds and support us uh, in all of our activities. So thank you. Uh, the foundation had a remarkable year in fundraising. Uh, after um, uh, a decrease in uh, fundraising, uh, all due uh, to COVID uh, last year, they rebounded nicely. Uh, this is the second largest uh, fundraising year in the history of the foundation, still with a fair amount of COVID headwinds uh, to navigate uh, that limit uh, their ability to bring people together for uh, major fundraising um, uh, events. And I think it's so important uh, to know that uh, these funds were contributed by over 30,000 donors uh, in our community, 30,000 donors who think the world of us, believe in us and support what we do. Um, uh, so thank you um, uh, to the foundation uh, and to all of our donors. So many initiatives uh, that I could highlight, just, just three uh, that I wanna share with you this morning. Uh, this year, the foundation established an endowed chair for nursing excellence. 
And I'm so pleased that Diane Huff, who's our Vice President for Operations and Patient Care Services and our Chief Nursing Officer, uh, was provided this chair, the first chairholder in recognition of her so many accomplishments. Congratulations, Diane. You are such a magnificent leader. We also established this year the Nicholas Family Endowment for Research. Um, this fund uh, provides uh, unrestricted uh, support for research activities in the department. We haven't had a fund like this in the past, and this will help us uh, move uh, uh, funds into areas of greatest opportunity in research that uh, help us garner larger grants and make uh, important discoveries. And finally, uh, the foundation provided for us uh, a diversity, equity, and inclusion fund. Uh, this is uh, uh, directed by Loretta Mateo and her team uh, and supports so many of the activities uh, I described to you uh, just a moment ago. I want to uh, say just a couple more words in the research domain and highlight uh, some new uh, accomplishments by the R.K. Mellon Institute for Pediatric Research. Uh, this institute was established by a very large gift from the R.K. Mellon Foundation, for which we are very, very grateful, and, and receives continuous support, a Tall Family Foundation and others uh, who uh, support a young faculty who um, are members of the R.K. Mellon Institute. And just to remind you all, every tenure stream faculty member at Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, regardless of uh, departmental affiliation, is a member of the R.K. Mellon Institute. The, the, the main objective of the R.K. Mellon Institute is to help science-oriented faculty earn promotion and earn their tenure. That's really the main goal. I can't thank George Giddes, um, uh, the director of the R.K. Mellon Institute, enough for all of his efforts, and uh, George's co-directors, associate directors, John Alcorn, uh, Bernard Kuhn, and Linda McAllister Lucas, Lucas, who make a formidable team uh, leading the R.K. Mellon Institute forward. They have developed many, many initiatives, uh, and I can only just uh, sketch them out briefly for you this morning, but they have a seminar series uh, highlighting um, uh, discoveries made by Mellon scholars, as well as others uh, in the CHP community. Two talks, uh, TED-type talks, 20 minutes each, uh, once a month. They're fantastic. Uh, please attend them if you can. Uh, they offer, uh, it's just the AIMS, an ideas and progress seminar series where they review specific AIMS pages of anybody at CHP who would like to submit. Thanks to John Alcorn, Mushman Malik for coordinating that. They handle pre-submission uh, grant application uh, review. So if you have an R01 application that you'd like reviewed before you submit it, contact George uh, to learn more about that program. Uh, the Mellon Institute has internal grants for Mellon scholars, uh, for scholars and trainees. And they also have an external advisory committee that guides them forward. Um, and uh, that committee is going to be meeting uh, uh, this fall to provide us some guidance about uh, the next steps uh, for the Mellon Institute. It's, again, it's, it's a wonderful initiative uh, combining the best of uh, philanthropy, uh, grant support, uh, academic leadership, and brilliant scholars um, who are truly making a difference. Thank you. My last uh, uh, thanks in the research domain uh, go to Diane Klein. Uh, Diane is our Director of Research Administration, uh, looks after so many aspects uh, of, um, uh, of our research, perhaps most importantly, uh, the administration of uh, the Rangos Research Center. Diane is retiring this year uh, after a long career at, at Children's, 36 years. Uh, we're so very, very grateful. And Diane, please accept uh, my heartfelt thanks on behalf of our entire team. Uh, we're so grateful and we wish you the very best in the years to come. Okay. I wanna speak now about some clinical service accomplishments and just uh, highlight uh, a few of, of, of the many, many, many accomplishments we've made um, as a clinical team. Uh, first, uh, we're still in the top 10. And I gotta tell you, I love this guy. I absolutely love this guy. Uh, he's smiling harder than Mark Sebko did when he got the call that we were still in the top 10. He's just a remarkable young man, glad that he's part of our team. And I'm really glad that all eight of the ranked pediatric uh, subspecialties within the U.S. News uh, Pediatric Children's Hospital Survey uh, are in uh, the top 20. Uh, well done uh, to the division directors, the clinical services directors, the support folks, uh, everybody who has uh, contributed to this effort. 
many, many accomplishments to laud here. And, uh, and, and really, I can only share just a couple. One that I'm just incredibly grateful to you all is our, our access initiative. Um, uh, our access initiative is absolutely essential uh, to allow us to provide the best care for the most kids. Uh, this is what keeps us going, uh, the best care for the most kids. Um, uh, in uh, this uh, two-year interval that we've been doing this work, a little more now, uh, we've moved uh, all the way down uh, to five days to a new visit when we take into consideration patient prep preference, when patients want to be seen. This is an industry standard. This is an industry leadership. This, this just blows the top off of what our uh, peers are able to do. Five days to a new appointment across the pediatric service line um, uh, is just unprecedented. Um, and so well done uh, to our clinical teams for, for doing this hard work. Uh, it really required um, incredible amount of uh, sacrifice and work and redesigning uh, strategies. Um, uh, thanks to Mike Communal and Seth Young for your leadership of these efforts. Um, but you clinicians, you are the folks who did this work. And so thank you. And just to let you know, uh, all of this access work was done uh, with uh, uh, truly uh, world record setting volumes. So here we were in CY19, just short of 295,000 outpatient visits. Uh, in CY21, this is uh, prorated uh, based on data up through the end of July. We're on track to hit 310,000 outpatient visits and still maintaining uh, the high quality and high access to care. Wonderful work. Uh, thank you. Now, a couple words about the emergency department. Uh, you all know uh, that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, had a, a dramatic effect in decreasing uh, our emergency department volumes. So when you look at these uh, uh, five years or so from uh, academic year 15 to 19, we saw about 220 visits a day. That's on an annualized basis of 80,000 visits a year. And uh, all of academic year uh, 21, uh, we saw about 158 uh, visits a day. But my gosh, have we gotten busy fast. In July, we're up to 229. In August, uh, we're up to 238. And if we maintain this pace, uh, we're gonna see uh, something like uh, 86,000 patients uh, a, a year this year. And we may even break that record because uh, just two days ago, um, uh, the emergency department saw 316 children. That's right, 316. And that shatters both the world and the Olympic record, uh, which was 306. Um, uh, this is just amazing. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ray Patetti, to Ray Vince for leading this emergency department forward. Thank you for all your providers. I know you're working so very hard. There's been a similar um, uh, uh, observation made uh, with our inpatient census. Um, it's declined in a, in a couple of years uh, with the COVID pandemic. And you can see that our, we're licensed for 313 beds and we're about 250 in the previous two academic years. Uh, but wait, uh, our ADC in July was 260 uh, and our ADC in August 274, that is uh, right back up to these uh, banner years we had in AY 17 and 18. And that's just also uh, continuing uh, to increase. And so um, uh, thank you uh, inpatient uh, providers and nurses and others who are supporting this in incredible volume. And this really brings me uh, uh, to some great thanks uh, for some heroes uh, in our hospital uh, at this time uh, of COVID. There are so many heroes to point out and I wish I had time uh, to share uh, photographs of all of them, but here are just a few. Uh, these uh, uh, beautiful photographs uh, were taken by uh, Jeanette Kinane, uh, an emergency medicine physician, uh, to just give you a sense of uh, the entire team and the emergency department. Um, nurses, physicians, support staff, uh, all working together uh, in, in, in beautiful synergy uh, to take care of all of these children in this incredibly uh, challenging time. Heroes, uh, in truth, uh, heroes right at our front door. I'm especially proud of Sylvia Wusu Ansa. Uh, Sylvia, uh, as you all know, was the second person in the city of Pittsburgh uh, to receive uh, COVID immunization uh, when the Pfizer vaccine uh, was uh, provided uh, emergency use uh, authorization. Uh, this story was so important, uh, so newsworthy that it was picked up by the New York Times. And I actually grabbed this photograph uh, from the New York Times website of our very own uh, Sylvia Awusu uh, Ansa, 
uh, uh, cheering us on as uh, only she can. Some of our heroes uh, 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 make food for us uh, and they keep our facilities clean and they uh, help our patients wayfind. These are some of my heroes, um, uh, those who I've met in the five years I've been here and gotten to know a little bit and who make Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh an absolutely great place. And I know each of you have heroes too. Uh, let them know uh, that they are your heroes. Um, there's so many, make your own collages. Share them uh, with those who are close to you. Um, uh, uh, I'm so grateful um, uh, that I'm able to work um, with this fine team. And lastly, who are more heroic than our patients um, uh, in, in, in uh, navigating uh, the conditions that they have uh, with um, uh, resolute confidence that all will be well and teaching us uh, how to wear masks. And thanks also uh, to Andrea Kunicki who shares uh, uh, these kinds of sentiments with the world. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Andrea. Of course, I pulled uh, these images uh, from your Twitter account. And now let me just say a few words about uh, COVID-19 uh, and the Department of Pediatrics uh, and also um, uh, the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 to which incredibly effective um, um, vaccines elicit antibodies uh, against. Uh, by my count, we're now uh, within the fifth wave of COVID-19, uh, the fifth wave of the pandemic. Tiny little wave at the beginning last spring and then a bit bigger one in the summer and then maybe a bicamerial wave uh, in the winter into the spring of uh, this year. And now we're in the middle of the fifth wave. Um, we're seeing a lot more COVID-19 um, uh, than we did in uh, months past uh, here at Children's. Uh, the system now has about 400 covid uh, in patients that's up from uh, about 30 just two months ago. Uh, and uh, it's not surprising uh, given the uh, impact uh, of the uh, pandemic uh, in our region. Now, uh, I have to say um, uh, not all of my uh, predictions uh, about COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 uh, have proven uh, true. Uh, this pandemic has been one of the most humbling experiences um, in, in my uh, professional life, especially so because I'm a virologist, I study viruses and um, I would think maybe I could make a, a more narrow confidence interval prediction about the future. But I've grown to appreciate that viruses uh, are like cats uh, and that uh, all things being equal, uh, uh, truly the virus is gonna do what it wants to do. And I think uh, we're seeing a little bit of that uh, with COVID-19. Now, I wanted to offer, uh, uh, given uh, the person who's uh, providing uh, these predictions, a couple of bold predictions about the future. Uh, and first, uh, some thoughts about the virus. Um, uh, one possibility is that SARS-CoV-2 may burn out, uh, just like uh, uh, SARS-CoV did. Uh, when it emerged in uh, late 2002, uh, it was gone uh, by the end of 2003 and really hasn't reemerged. That's a possibility. Uh, variants of SARS-CoV-2 with increased transmissibility may continue to be selected, prolonging the pandemic uh, for years. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. Or SARS-CoV-2 may gradually diminish in prevalence and join the pantheon of human respiratory viruses like so many others that circulate uh, within uh, our community. Uh, I don't think the first is very likely. Uh, I think either the second or third are, are the most likely. And I think we can probably influence this to some extent um, uh, by uh, working as hard as we can to help uh, everyone we know uh, be vaccinated. Uh, that will certainly help uh, vaccinees uh, from getting sick and will also decrease the viral loads and uh, contribute to diminishing transmission. But we also need to mask uh, and we need to take precautions, especially we're in crowded indoor settings with lots of people. Uh, masks are the most effective tool at preventing transmission, we can prevent transmission, we can prevent selection of variants and do our part to put COVID-19 in the rear view. Uh, well, what about us? Um, uh, what does our future look like? Well, I think that respiratory and, uh, virus infections are gonna be more prevalent in children this fall and winter. Uh, I'm worried about uh, a, a tridemic um, uh, epidemic of uh, RSV. We're already seeing it now, as you know, uh, epidemic of flu uh, and the ongoing pandemic of COVID-19. Uh, what worries me most is uh, two birth cohorts who, who haven't uh, seen either flu or RSV. 
uh, and we're going to be seeing uh, uh, children with those uh, virus infections uh, this fall and winter. I think we're going to be wearing masks in healthcare settings for the foreseeable future. I don't really see any uh, options around that. They are the most effective means for us to protect our patients and to protect each other. And here, I think we're going to educate, uh, care, educate, discover, advocate, and lead uh, all the while while looking after ourselves and each other. And I have to say of all the uh, bold prediction I've shared with you, this is my highest confidence predictions. And my confidence comes uh, from our commitment uh, to caring uh, for children uh, and the support we receive uh, from each other, uh, the families who we serve and our leadership uh, to do our work. And I know uh, that the future uh, is uncertain. And I know uh, that there are challenges that are in front of us. I also know we are going to get through it and we're gonna provide uh, the best care for the most kids. And we're gonna take care of each other uh, as we're doing so. I wanna give some thanks now as I turn to the end of my talk this morning uh, to our uh, divisional and executive leadership uh, with leaders like Alejandro Hoberman and Bob Hickey. I think our future is bright. Uh, here pictured with this unfortunate fish. And Dr. Hickey, I may ask uh, uh, Dr. Silva to see you uh, to talk about your future orientation and your parental support to help you uh, with uh, tobacco products. Uh, we have uh, remarkable division directors and center directors. Uh, uh, thank you for the wonderful work uh, that you do, uh, helping your faculty earn promotion, supporting uh, all of the uh, activities within your divisions. I'm uh, incredibly fortunate to work with a, a spectacular executive uh, committee uh, composed of all of our vice chairs and uh, our two executive administrators, uh, Mike Communal and uh, Jeff Knorr. What a wonderful group of dedicated uh, professionals to lead us forward. This year, of course, we welcome uh, uh, Sylvia Choi uh, as our new vice chair of faculty affairs. Uh, Sylvia is also president of the Children's Hospital professional staff. And uh, we're so grateful uh, to Sylvia uh, for joining us. A number of teams look at, after us. This is the research administrative uh, management team uh, that coordinates uh, pre and post award grant support, uh, all of the administrative activities uh, within the department, information technology. Um, golly, I can't thank them enough for the great work they do. We have a superb uh, clinical uh, research leaders uh, who support the Pediatric Clinical and Translational Research Center, and of course, many other clinical research endeavors uh, within uh, the department and the hospital. Thank you. Um, our clinical administrative management team, uh, led by Mike Communal, uh, is just spectacular. We couldn't have a better group to support our clinical operations and help us uh, do the important work we do uh, to provide care um, uh, for all the children we see. I am in incredibly uh, grateful to be a member of two uh, wonderful teams. This is our uh, Department of Pediatrics administrative team. Uh, I can't think uh, of a group who works harder as humble servants to support our care, uh, education, and research mission. Uh, thank you all uh, for the wonderful work uh, that you do. And of course, my lab team, uh, the team that anchors me, um, uh, provides such strength uh, for the work I do uh, in the department, uh, in the hospital, in our institutions, uh, thank you all um, uh, for the wonderful work you do, uh, your wonderful um, uh, uh, collegiality, collaboration, your friendship, and for working on a virus that is much more attractive than SARS-CoV-2. In a year of transitions, I want to thank Miranda Feldman and welcome uh, Dominique White. Uh, Miranda, thank you uh, for helping me uh, to lead uh, the Department of Pediatrics. And Dominique, uh, I so look forward uh, uh, to working with you. Uh, our future is indeed bright. And last, uh, I want to thank uh, our hospital leaders. Um, uh, uh, Mark Sepko, Diane Hupp, Brian Martin have worked so hard in so many ways to support us. Uh, you know many of them, but there are a couple of activities you might not know about. Um, you might not know that when Diane Hupp is not immunizing uh, most of the city of Pittsburgh, uh, she's working with Mark and Brian to check in families at the front door of Children's Hospital. You might not know uh, that they work with the koalas uh, to help prepare and serve food uh, for our team. Uh, a lot of this work is done in the evenings, um, but they uh, enjoy uh, this work immensely. We're grateful. And you might not know that I've uh, taught them just a little bit about uh, virology uh, so that they could help us uh, do some experiments uh, uh, to put this uh, COVID-19 pandemic in a rearview mirror. 
uh, Mark, uh, Diane, uh, Brian, thank you so very much uh, for leading us in this uh, challenging time uh, and helping us uh, go forward to accomplish our missions of care, uh, education, uh, and discovery. Thank you. Well, this brings me uh, to the end of uh, the State of the Department uh, 2021. Um, uh, despite uh, uh, certainly uh, some uh, challenges with this pandemic, uh, we have had a remarkable year. And I am so very grateful uh, for you, Department of Pediatrics, so very grateful. And for those uh, who have a question or just want to join a discussion, um, please visit with me in the meet and greet. Uh, there's a Zoom link in the chat uh, and you can access that. Uh, all questions are welcome um, and uh, join me if you can. And I wish you all uh, a very good rest of the day on this Thursday, um, a very good year to come. And from the satellite studios of the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, I'll sign off. Uh, thanks much, Department of Pediatrics. Uh, thanks much. Goodbye now.